Priestland looks back on the recent papal visit and at those who suddenly made their presence felt, the British Catholics, John Paul's people. the sweetness of the true faith to some, to others the reek of superstitious mumbo-jumbo, the high mysteries of the mass, the vestments and genuflections seem to set it and its followers apart from the rest of us, have led some of us to regard them as a kind of secret society with foreign connections. What do we think we know of these, our fellow citizens, who happen also to be Catholics? Bride's head. Dogmas. Priests in long skirts and I think of the Pope. Over-decorativeness of side chapels. They go to Mass on Sundays, that's all. They're far more religious than Church of England people. They pray to Mary, I believe. Birth control. Confession. This authority, which I think in the leadership, goes with arrogance. They do have an awful lot of ritual. We don't really understand them, I don't think. But John Paul's British people can speak for themselves. I would not change my faith for anything. It's just something very special to me, I wouldn't change it. There's something special about being a Catholic. I know it sounds terrible, but it does. There is. It's the commitment. If you actually say you're going to go to church, that's a big step. I think you can just be C of E and not have to actually do anything apart from go to Mass once a year. And I want something more than that. The commitment to something that's very akin to a large family. There is a form of leadership which has weathered the storms throughout the centuries. John Paul is Holy Father to a worldwide family, diverse but sharing one spiritual citizenship. It's amazing because I've travelled right through Europe and really you can come across Catholics, you can go to Mass and you can talk. I mean, I can't talk particularly well, very little Italian and yet even speaking in O-level French to a bunch of Italians, it's amazing how close as a Catholic you can be you know, because you really share something at a very deep level. And so um, language as such doesn't become a barrier. I feel I'm part of a huge group of people with a tremendous richness of experience, a tremendous richness of ideas, varying from your very traditional conservative middle-class white European or American Catholics on one hand, to your working class, your peasants, your black Catholics in the third world. Now, each has got a history, each has got an experience, each has a, has a story of faith. Now, to be part of that outfit, to me, is fantastic. Carlton Towers, home of the Duke of Norfolk. Old families like his preserved the faith through penal times. The Stapletons lived peacefully here, huh? and uh, as did many of the other Catholic families up in the north. Up there. Deprived of most of their civil rights, these old families, the recusants, paid and prayed and survived as unbroken English Catholics. Most common folk couldn't afford the luxury of defying the state, and it was the smuggled priests who were dragged from their hiding places to be hanged and disemboweled. You can see here, hidden in the wall, there, so you don't notice. Those who think Rome repressive tend to forget how unfairly Catholics were treated in Britain until quite recently. Now, there is no problem at all about being a Catholic in England. There was a little bit of a problem when I first, say, left Ambleforth and went into the army. You know, there was always a joke in the army that the Catholics were left footers and so on. You weren't totally English which is most unjust because we've all suffered in the wars and been totally behind uh, England ever since Catholic Emancipation, 1829. But now, I think uh, 
you people almost admire you for being a Catholic, you know, because they, they know that you are sticking to something definite and you don't drift. Even more loyal to its church than the Norfolk family, the island of Eriske in the Hebrides seems hardly to have heard of the Reformation. It's totally Catholic and totally dependent on the sea. For its 200 souls, the fishing and the faith come together in a fisherman's mass. It's conducted, like most conversation on Eriske, in Gaelic. The island's priest, Father Macmillan, blesses the boats and their tackle. In practical terms, he's helped to found the island cooperative and experiments with oyster breeding, a new role for a priest in a deeply conservative community. Some of his ways of relaxing are so untypical of the priesthood that you can't help wondering what his parishioners think of them. I think they're getting used to it now. <laughs> Uh, they were a bit taken aback at first, I think. I hope that people are beginning to see the priest as another human being with a role in the community of a religious leader rather than somebody set apart. Like anyone, he has chores to be done, but a Catholic priest is set apart and often isolated by the very fact of his celibacy. To have a wife and children, yes, that would be nice. Um, I do feel happy in my life as a priest. I feel that I'm achieving some purpose in this world. Everyone has been given a special spot by God. I think I've found my... Father Macmillan can certainly be happy about mass attendance in his own special spot. Most islanders go at least twice a week. The mass binds them together as a community and helps to preserve their Gallic tongue. Unlike many mainlanders, they also go regularly to confession. And I find that non-Catholics, and quite often some Catholics too, are terrified of, of confession and frightened, suspicious. I think it's because they don't realize what it's about. When the person confesses to the priest, he is performing a symbolic act where he is admitting to God and to himself. The priest is there as the representative of God, as it were, but the important thing, first of all, is that the person admits his own guilt. Amen. In a place like this, one has to be very careful what sins one mentions, because if you mention a sin, other people might know who has committed it. On Eriske, then, to be a Catholic and to take the sacraments regularly is natural and inevitable. It's barely a matter of conscious choice. And there's something of this, I find, in all born Catholics. To be born into a clan like the Norfolks is to have the family as one's basic community. It's the word you hear again and again, the very building block of the Catholic Church. I have no doubt at all that the most important human unit is the family. And I am very proud to have had a very happy mother and father and my seven brothers and sisters. And we're all married and we're all together and there's something like 50 nephews and nieces, you know, or first cousins. And I think the family is the most essential unit. And the Catholic Church's views on the family are exactly the same as the Church of England's views on the family. You must do everything to protect the family. It's an essential unit. The Duke's unit at this muster includes three daughters, a son, and two Protestant sons-in-law. I mean, you must have uh, read, if not seen, Bride's Head. Uh -huh. Could you see anything of the family in that? I hope not. What I loathed about that book, or certainly about the adaptation, the TV adaptation of it was, that it made us out as something def different and special, which we're not. What's Are we? The, what's the rest of you think about that? Could I ask Tessa? Um, yes, I agree with Mummy. I think it made, it made Catholicism seem uh, sort of VIP, which it definitely isn't at all. <laughs> well, there's a Protestant up there, um, Roderick, for example. <laughs> Do you feel that this family's Catholicism makes it difficult to get on with? Not especially. 
I get sort of ribbed about it and I get asked how I handle it. I think I was most worried about it when I was thinking about marrying Tessa. Certainly when I actually wanted to get married to her, I had to ask her father for her hand. And the only time I could grab him in his busy life was when he was in the bath one evening. <laughs> and um, I seem to remember I was terrified he was going to ask me exactly what my intentions were about bringing up children and all that sort of thing. And to my great relief, all he said was, now listen, there's obviously going to be, you know, this business about children. Um, I mean, you will bring them up as Christians, won't you? And I absolutely sort of see a relief whirled over me as I wasn't actually asked point blank, they will be brought up as Catholics. But I knew what he meant. And I think the great thing about this family, which a lot of people outside don't realize, is that they are Christians. They happen to be Catholics and their faith matters a great deal to them. But they aren't bigoted about it. When I joined this family, I was slightly aware of the fact that um, Catholicism seemed to be the religion before Christianity was the religion. And it's slightly a feeling of, I'm a Catholic who's a Christian, and not I'm a Christian who's a Catholic. The thing I'm jealous of as a Protestant is that they have had this discipline, you know, going to church on Sundays and, uh, and those sort of things, which I makes think makes it much easier much for easier. them. Yes. Doesn't it? Yes. I think that's something we have been given, definitely, is um, we have been given a very happy family from age one week old. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with Catholicism as such. Well, I've known large Presbyterian families who've been as happy. I mean, my wife's for one, for example. Um, so it isn't necessarily the, necessarily the Catholicism that brings this. Well, I think, it's, I think um, Catholicism does demand a certain amount of discipline, which I think is probably a very good thing to keep a happy family life together. And we do have a faith. It is one thing to have faith, but something more to have a faith and to believe implicitly in its teachings. I doubt if all the Norfolks do that. Implicit faith is a characteristic of the Irish Catholics who contributed so much to the revival of the church in Britain and who continue to demonstrate that faith and works must go hand in hand as they do at St. Joseph's Hospice for the Dying in Hackney. No fear whatsoever of what's going to happen. I know in the Lord's good time he'll take me when I'm ready. None of us go before our time. No more is the average Catholic among us really Irish, but nuns like Sister Paula are still here bringing the light of their faith to some shadowed valleys. I think it's in dying patients especially, it is a great, great help if they have faith. It's the time in your life that you need to hold on to something. And it's wonderful to think that the Lord is waiting for you just when you say goodbye to Hackney. So, um, being always a Catholic, I couldn't imagine myself being anything else. And it does make, because um, dealing with the patient, you know, it's very wonderful to think you're with a patient perhaps who is just dying. You may be the last person here that patient was speaking to. And when it opens his eyes, in the other world, it's the Lord we're waiting for you. It's nice to think, you know, we very often ask patients, won't they remember us when they go to heaven? And it's, it, it's a wonderful thing, really, at one's faith. Basil Hume personifies English Catholicism. Say, you've given it the wrong person, the Pope's gone. <laughs> People don't normally give me flowers. He might just be Pope himself one day. Too sweet. Can I do what the Pope does? <laughs> I'm learning. But I would never want to deny the contribution which the Irish have made to the church in this country. And I think the special quality of the faith of the Irish people has been a very important factor in our Catholicism in this country. I wouldn't like either to uh, forget the contribution of uh, some of the 
immigrants who've come into this country. Holloway in North London is typical of inner city parishes which may combine as many as 25 different nationalities. The Catholic Church has always tried to ensure its continued harvest of the faithful by building its schools first, its churches later. And the parish priest is expected to maintain a firm tie between church and school. Divisive, but who else takes the trouble? Father Ian Domerson holds a classroom mass with up-to-date participation. And let's first of all, let's tell him that we're sorry if we've been unkind to other members of his family, because if we have, we've been unkind to him. Lord, we are sorry for fighting and kicking. Lord, we are sorry. Lord, we are sorry for not sharing. Lord, we are sorry. Lord, we are sorry. Lord, we are sorry for not being kind to people. Lord, we are sorry. How many of you have got uh, younger brothers and sisters? Could you put your hands up? Oh, quite a lot of you. That's interesting. OK, put your hands down. One knows many Catholics who groan at the memory of their school days, and yet it never really leaves them. But isn't this the cunning Catholic way? Catch them young, mould their minds, uh, they're yours forever. No, lead them. I wouldn't say catch them. I, and I think it is a ma matter of leadership, really, because ultimately they have got to make up their own minds. But if you're doing something in schools, you know, like a mass, um, or if you're instructing them, all you're really doing is backing up what the home is doing. How, how can you make your first Holy Communion? Well, it's really when you're ready. Then you can make your first Holy Communion. What age? Because how old are you now? Eight. Yes. Well, I'm sure you're nearly ready, you know. All right? OK. God bless. Bye-bye. Get back to school, won't you? All right. The trouble is, vocations to the priesthood have been falling and old priests are dying off. To try and give Father Domerson more time for his pastoral visits, Holloway delegates more work now to lay people, trying to break down the traditional let father do it attitude of old time Catholics. A few old timers are shocked, but many more lend a hand. Thank you, Pastor. Say a prayer for me, won't you? Yes. Yeah, and I hope your leg's not too bad. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, we've used that While the parish magazine gets edited, Father Domerson brings the church to those who can't get to it. Yes. Because how long has he been dead now? Five years. God, it seems like yesterday. It seems like yesterday, mm. doesn't it? It does. Mm. Yeah. I feel he's still here. Oh, well, he is in some ways with you, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He's he a wonderful is. man. I know. I know. Mm. Yes. A great chap. We've got a deficit of 11,000 at the moment projected for this year. And can a repayment we... exercise to 50,000 would bring it up to 20,000 a year we've got to find. Okay, can I, can I interrupt you? Unfortunately, you lay participation um, tends to include the dreaded committee system. They've hired a full-time lay assistant, but is he worth it? ...sheets on what he actually does, OK? Well, I gave that sheet of paper to a fully qualified O&M work study officer. I get a bit worried when we start, start saying, well, you know, effectiveness and cost effectiveness and things like that. It's a matter of service. Service the priest gives day and night. But why should a normal, vigorous young man feel called to devote his life to a job that is outwardly so restricting? Martin Lamour, a 24-year-old Scot, is now in his second rigorous year at Allen Hall Seminary in London. It's a special occasion now because Cardinal Hume has dropped in to keep in touch with the priests of tomorrow. We haven't, so again, we haven't even got a football team, have you? Ah, no. This is a top secret. We're talking about these things that are... Uh, Can you get 11 players? Depends who you count as players. You know, sort of, um... Today's students at Allen Hall are far from being snatched from the cradle by the church. They include a former bus conductor, an ex-BBC accountant. Every one of them's done some sort of job in the outside world. The director, Father John Coglan, prefers men who are past their early 20s. These are men who have, I don't know whether that's sown their wild oats is the right expression, but they have lived and they know what life is about. 
I'm not very keen on the kind of person who comes in and says, you know, I, I'm going to be a priest, and comes in you know, with his Beretta cassock and black sh buckle shoes already packed, you know, and a set of vestments as well. I'm not keen on those kind of people. What? Father Coglin is particularly keen on Martin's skills as an electrician. They come in handy in the boiler room. For Martin used to be a technical petty officer in the Royal Navy, which is practical, but a long jump from liturgy and systematic theology. His vocation must have been rather a shock for his shipmates. They thought I was taking the mickey out of them. Most of them thought I was trying to get an easy way out of the Navy. I thought of, this is an un an unfound as yet way of getting out the navy, you know, sort of, he's swinging the lead, which is fair enough. Um, on the other hand, there was a bit of interest, a bit of fascination, and of course being on board the ship and a practicing Catholic can be a terribly unfortunate thing, you know, it's a heck of a combination, but um, for the most part they tolerated it, they're a very, very tolerant crowd, you know. Why did you make this decision? <laughs> I asked myself that question many times. It's a thing, once you get religion, you can't get away from it. Once God sticks his finger on you, you don't get away easy in whatever field you're working in. You just can't really settle down. Now, there are priests in your family. What did your family think when you decided to become one too? I announced at a general family gathering once we were all together for, I think it was my sister's birthday party. And they thought, well, you know, have, you know, are we expecting some big change? And they look at it in terms of what you cannot do. And not just people at home, but, you know, people in general think, what, oh, you always give up things, they say. Oh, you're very brave, you know, you're giving up all that, you know. I'm sure, I think. But they are getting used to the idea I think they've come to recognise now that the Catholic Church of today was not, is not the Catholic Church that they were brought up in. But one end of the Catholic Church still looks remarkably as it was, and it takes an expert to distinguish this from the Middle Ages or at least from the Italian Renaissance. Christopher Monckton is a leading Catholic journalist to whom that kind of age-old richness speaks deeply. And it's not for Sundays only. Mass is for midweek lunch breaks too. Every Catholic can either pray while he's at work, or if there's a church, as in central London, where we're so fortunate to have so many, he can just slip in very quickly and uh, do a quick kneel and a quick pray, and if there is Mass, and they're, they're very good, they do arrange Mass at lunchtime, we're going to have Mass as well. And this is so easy, and so painless, and so wonderful each time one does it, uh, that uh, it would be silly not to. And so it's only natural that if, as today, being Ash Wednesday, uh, I, and in fact a lot of my friends, we'll be going today to the London Oratory Church at Brompton, which is a very beautiful church, where they do Mass very beautifully. They say it and they sing it really worthily and wonderfully. That the Mass is not always done worthily greatly disturbs Monckton and his fellow members of the conservative Catholic group Pre Ecclesia. We, my good friends, we are the people of England and Wales. And now we will speak. And now Pre Ecclesia will held a big heard. rally to petition As their Pope bishops on the say, eve of the Pope's visit. We are no mere elitist caucus. We are the ordinary simple Catholic people of England and Wales. All walks of life, all parts of the country, all occupations and professions, one church. One thousand members voted almost unanimously to restore the mass in Latin, root out folk singing and lay participation in the services, abjure heresy and restore tradition. We believe in the tradition of the church. That doesn't mean we're old fashioned, re reactionary or square. It simply means that we are Catholics. Their love of the old ways is matched, says John Biggs Davison, by their grief at losing them. I suspect there are many in this hall today who are just clinging on, clinging on by their teeth or their eyebrows, practicing their religion, at best without joy, 
and at worst with grief and anguish. We've had so many letters and I had one yesterday from someone in Bexhill. It was Vatican II, the reforming council launched by John XXIII, which started the rot, or rather, say loyal Catholics, the way the council has been radically misinterpreted by trendy bishops. The Catholic laity have the right to make their spiritual needs known to their pastors, above all to their supreme pastor, the Holy Father himself. Surely we are entitled to tell him that we wish to worship with the rite of mass that has sustained countless millions of Catholics throughout the nations and the centuries. This was the form of mass that the martyr priests of England and Wales celebrated in secret, often at the cost of their lives. But does the mass of the 16th century speak for the young Catholics of Holloway today? The folk choir with their guitars and recorders feel they have something to say that doesn't come naturally in a dead language. <laughs> It's like if Christ was around, how would he respond to you today? He'd come in and sit down and chat with you and you'd be sitting around having cups of coffee with him and stuff like that. Mm. I think God just has to be sitting there saying, what, what are those people doing? They don't understand a word of what's going on and it just doesn't make any sense. It has no value for them, no meaning for them and it doesn't entice them to live any better than they're living without it. Well, for instance, Christ didn't have the Last Supper with his back to the apostles up on a high altar, did he? Yeah. He was together. They were all together as one. He didn't yeah. have his back. He wasn't chanting away in Latin or anything. I mean, well, he wouldn't be, but I mean, he didn't have his back to them. I'm sure he didn't. I mean, why would he have a Last Supper with him have his back to them? Kind of. As, you know, it's, people might like something formal like that, but religion isn't formal. Religion is something you share with everybody. The communion is unity with the rest of the people in the Mass. And so I don't see how you can have unity in Mass if the Mass is in Latin. No. That's why I enjoy the folk masses. You really do feel part of our masses. And surely if the great youth rallies that greeted the Pope here said anything to the church, it was, we have faith and we have joy, what are you going to do with it? We try our way and see how it goes. Let's, let's, when, when we do it on Sunday. Dressing up for your first communion is more than a kind of party for Catholic children. It's their entry to the world of sacraments, a language beyond Latin or English. The Catholics form about 10% of our population, but in terms of active and regular church going, they're the biggest denomination we have. The Mass, with its Holy Communion, lies at the heart of it, and about 50% of Catholics claim to attend on a more or less regular basis. But it has to be said that even Catholics are now less observant than they were 10 or 12 years ago. It's just that the decline began later among Catholics. probably as much variety of belief among Catholics as among Anglicans. One quarter don't believe in hell, one fifth don't accept the real presence of Christ in the communion. But the importance of belonging to a family, a congregation, remains. In an age when so many people insist that faith is a purely personal matter, the Catholic Church continues to assert that it is not, that it is held together by something handed down over the centuries and immune to personal fads and fancies, 
The Church of Rome is hardly a democracy, but it is for the people. You can go to churches in London, certainly Brompton Oratory is part.